please help me welcome to the stage our first keynote of the day, Mr. Jay Bear. Thank you, sir. It's going to be the last keynote. It's going to be so good to just go home. That's it. <laughs> you know what I've realized is that, and this is a particularly apt in this industry, that, that new doesn't necessarily mean better. It just means new. And we get seduced all the time, especially in the social media business, that just because something hasn't happened yet, that therefore it must be better than what came before it. And, and I don't think that's true. And, and Jason mentioned the book that I, that I wrote with, with Amber Naslin, and we talk about that a lot in the book, right? That, that we have to focus on how to be social and worry less about doing social media. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about tactics and tools today. I actually don't do this very much, but today we'll talk about tactics and tools because it's social fresh and it's a very, very smart, experienced crowd. But don't fall into the trap of getting sucked into the weeds about Pinterest this and whatever the next thing is because you will end up chasing your tail forever. You will never be on top of it. Trust me. I do this all day, every day. You'll never be on top of it. So if you're doing social media for a company, and I think most of you probably are, figure out what kind of relationship you want to have between the company and its customers and prospects. Do that first. Then figure out how to measure it, and then figure out what sort of tools and channels and tactics make that a reality. There's way too much upside down thinking in this business where it's like, what's my Twitter strategy? Every time somebody asks me, what's my Twitter strategy, I want to smack them in the head. <laughs> There's no such thing as a Twitter strategy. It is by definition not strategic. It is a tool that helps you achieve a strategy. And the only thing that's worse about, that, that is worse than asking about a Twitter strategy is asking what's my Facebook strategy, which is what we're going to talk about today. Now, Facebook and email have to be friends, right? They need to work together in a complementary fashion. There's a lot of rumors, hype, angst about email, especially in our business, right? Because email is, is yesterday's news, right? How many times have you heard Facebook is going to kill email, right? I think Social Fresh probably wrote that blog post at some point. Bastards. <laughs> Link baiters. So, <laughs> look. Nothing is going to kill email. Not to, you know, first of all, let's realize that you have to have an email address to even be on Facebook, so there's that. <laughs> so there's that small option. But we've got to stop panicking that, that somehow email is going out of business. We vote with our behavior. 58% of adults in this country check email first thing in the morning. Okay? Whatever you do first in the morning is what is most important to you. And as of last year, it was 58% check email first. Facebook is 11%. Okay? It's a huge, huge difference. So that's one of the rumors, right? Is that, is that email is, is going to kill or be killed by Facebook. One of the other sort of rumors and, and storylines and narratives that we have is that we need to use Facebook to get more customers. That somehow, by definition, Facebook is a customer acquisition machine. It's like a Wonka Vader or a Starbelly Sneech machine or something, and, and all of a sudden you will just instantly show up with a Facebook page and new customers will arise like the Phoenix. And it's fundamentally not true. But yet a lot of people think that to be true. 44% of corporate social marketers look at Facebook as a way to get net new customers, as the primary reason for Facebook. And those 44% of social corporate marketers should not have a job. Because that is not the way Facebook actually works. Okay? In reality, we like what we like. You do not roll around Facebook, kind of surfing around and say, wow, that's a company I've never heard of. I have no idea what they sell. I'm going to click the like button. You don't do that. Nobody does that. We like what we like, right? We like Social Fresh. We like The Muppet Show. We like Convince and Convert. We like Sesame Street. We like things that we've already had experiences with. 
So there are circumstances, sure. There are circumstances where you have the ripple in the pond effect, where one of your current customers interacts with a piece of your content on Facebook, and then their friends see content about your brand in their newsfeed or in their stream that maybe they wouldn't have seen. And, and as a result, you turn your customers into sort of accidental marketers. That does happen. Here's an example. We talked about my co-author, Amber Naslin. She had a status update on Facebook a few weeks ago about some book. She's a, a grammar Nazi word nerd kind of person. So this is some, uh, a blog post about a grammar book, which sounds hopelessly terrible to me, but to each their own. And, and she put this post out there and, and had three likes and two comments. And presumably, those five people were not aware of this crazy grammar book before. So that does happen, right? That ripple in the pond effect happens. But it is the exception, not the rule. If you believe that this is how Facebook works and that this is the low-hanging fruit in Facebook, you're absolutely wrong. DDB did a study last year that found that 84% of the people who are fans of corporate Facebook pages are current or former customers of that company. And that absolutely passes the sniff test. Think about how you use Facebook. We like what we like. Facebook is a ratification of a relationship, not the creation of a relationship. So what other technologies do we use to ratify relationships? Hmm. If Facebook is primarily opt-in and the people who are interacting with us on Facebook are customers or prospective customers who have given us permission to interact with them by clicking the like button, that sounds an awful lot like email. What Facebook really does is helps your customers and prospective customers remember you. And email does the exact same thing. It's about keeping your brand top of mind over the long haul within an audience that has chosen to allow you to do that. Okay? So in the inbox, you're competing against all kinds of emails from your coworkers and your mom and your wife. And in Facebook, you're competing for attention in the newsfeed with the same thing. Other companies, your wife, your spouse, your friends, it's the same circumstance. So I was watching the Super Bowl. I was actually in New Orleans. I was given a, a speech on Sunday in New Orleans. And I actually had tickets to the game. I live in Indiana. I had tickets to the game. Couldn't go because I foolishly booked the speaking engagement like months and months ago. And I thought the Super Bowl was a different day. And it was a colossal, colossal blunder. But I was in New Orleans and had a great time. And I, I talked to my son uh, during the game. And I said, what do you think of the game? And, and Madonna came on. And he's like, and we were on the phone. He's like, wow, she's just like Lady Gaga. And I'm like, dude, you've got it backwards, right? You have this whole thing backwards. And it is so apt because email is Madonna. It is the original. <laughs> it's just kind of broke down and not cool now, right? And Facebook is Lady Gaga, right? It's the same. Look, email is Madonna. Facebook is Lady Gaga. It's the same damn thing with a fresh coat of paint. Strategically, it's the exact same thing. So when you think about that, that, that how we use Facebook for business and how we use email for business are strategically similar, why is it that in almost every company, especially companies of a certain size, the people who handle email and the people who handle Facebook don't even sit in the same floor or the same office or sometimes not even in the same city. It's ridiculous. We have to integrate these two channels for maximum effectiveness. And there's three ways to do that. There is operations and measurement integration. There's channel and audience integration. And there's message and content integration. Let's talk about operations and measurement. So when you think about, about Facebook and email, the mathematical lingua franca of both is actually strikingly similar. We just sometimes call them different things. 
So in email, we call it a subscribe, right, or an opt-in. In Facebook, we call it a like, but it's the same mechanism. In email, we call it an unsubscribe. In Facebook, it's an unlike or a hide. You hide something in your newsfeed. In email, we call it an open. In Facebook now, we call it reach, since they rolled out the new massively confusing insights product. But reach is the most similar to open. In email, we call it a click. And in Facebook, we now call it an engaged user. Another massively complicated advance. In email, we call it a forward, forward to a friend. And in Facebook, we call it a share. These are all the same behaviors. We just call them something differently. Now, the other thing that we talk about a lot in this industry, which drives me crazy, and I know it drives other people here crazy as well, like Chuck, is this question of, what's a Facebook fan worth? I have seen multiple studies that say, with alleged authority, that a Facebook fan is worth $136, $9.56, and $3.80. There is a pretty big gap in those findings, clearly. The real answer, of course, is that a Facebook fan is worth whatever it is worth to your company. That by definition, that value is pegged to your organization and how you use Facebook and how you use other forms of digital marketing and how you convert. But you have to ask, right, is this math imaginary? Now, the nice thing is we're getting closer to be able to track this in a more meaningful way without having an advanced statistics degree. And I know Chris Penn will talk a lot about that this afternoon. But one of the things that he'll mention is Google Analytics' new ability to allow you to measure cross-channel impact. Right? It used to always be we could only count last touch conversions. So if someone interacts with you on Facebook, they see banner ads, they read your blog posts, and then ultimately they search for you on Google and they fill out a form Google search gets credit for that lead. Now, with the new Google Analytics, they track all of those previous touches, and they have what's called assisted conversions. So you can say, oh, Facebook helped that. Email helped that. The blog helped that, which makes a big, big difference in how you look at the overall effectiveness of your digital marketing by channel. One of the things I do, though, is look at valuing Facebook through the prism of email investment. Who here actually has a, a, a fairly serious email newsletter, email marketing program for their company? Interesting, not as many as you would think. So if you have email, you have email expense, right? Email is not free. In fact, email in some cases is, is less free than Facebook because you have to pay somebody to send emails and you don't have to pay anybody to send Facebook status updates typically. So what you do here is you figure out the true cost of, of what it really requires for your organization to send an email. And that's all in cost, right? So what do you pay an email service provider? What do you pay a designer? What do you pay a strategist in time? Um, what do you pay an analyst? You know, what, all the things that go into that, right? Divide that by the size of your list and the number of emails you send a month and what you will get is a number, a cost of per email sent. Multiply that by unique clicks, okay? So difference between unique clicks and total clicks. Unique clicks are number of people that clicked on your email. Total clicks are the overall number of clicks because people can and do click your email multiple times. So you want unique clicks. Then calculate your total number of Facebook engaged users. Multiply that by the cost of your unique email clicks. And what you end up with is a value per click on Facebook. So if you do it this way, the best way to get this data actually, short commercial, is I use pagelever.com, which is, in my opinion, far, far, far better than, than what Facebook's native insights will give you. You can do a lot more data cutting. You can roll back three, four, six months just a much better product. It's relatively low cost. So if you use something like pagelever.com, you can pull out this engaged consumption number, which shows all the different people that, that clicked on something that you have in Facebook. So let's say that it costs you two cents overall, total all-in costs, two cents to send an email. Your average click-through rate on your email is 10%. So what that means is that it costs you, as a business, 
20 cents to acquire a click in an email on average. You with me? If it costs you 20 cents to acquire a click on email and you have 86,151 Facebook consumptions in a month as one of our clients did here, if you value each of those clicks the same way that you value an email click in terms of your investment, what your Facebook click value here is 17,230 for the month. Does that make sense? So does that mean that Facebook fans are worth whatever? It does not. All this helps you do is understand what Facebook is worth to your business through the prism of what you're already spending money on, which is email. I have a free worksheet for this, a spreadsheet that actually walks you through these calculations, ar.gy slash Facebook, capital F, uh, and you can grab that spreadsheet and download it and, and make your own calculations if you choose to do so. Well, Argyle is a sponsor of the Social Pros podcast, so I get first crack at all the good keywords. I'd be happy to sell it to you, Chris. So your email people and your Facebook people should be the same people. Now, did anybody ever notice that Grover and Elmo are basically the exact same character? Right? Grover was like 20, 30 years earlier. Like, you know what? This Grover thing is getting kind of tired. Maybe we should just make the eyes a little higher and change the nose from pink to orange, make them a tiny bit shorter and the fur a little shaggier. New character. New character. Billions of dollars in Elmo sales. Kermit wants you to do a little exercise here. Show of frog hands. How many people here have in their company the email people and the social media people are the same people? Not bad. Not bad. That's pretty good. It's a progressive crowd. That's probably a third. That's good. That's great. Second piece of this is channel and audience integration. So one of the things that is very, very true in, in digital marketing now is that inboxes are exploding. Everything is fracturing. So you have to think about how do we build what we call a touch point corral around each of your customers. How can we maximize the number of ways that we can communicate with each of these people. And companies do this very poorly because in many cases, like, well, we got their email address, so we're done. Or they like us on Facebook, so we're done. No, you're not done. You're not anywhere near done. That's step one. That's not step 10. If you have a Facebook like, the goal then needs to be to get their email address. Or if you have their email address, the goal needs to be to get the Facebook like, or the Twitter follow, or the SMS sign up, or the LinkedIn connection, or the Google Plus circle. The holy grail in my opinion, is to have all six of these data points in your database for every single customer and prospect. And it's doable if you plan it out and think about how do we use drip marketing over time to get people to connect with us in all these different environments. So there's ways to do this tactically that can make a big difference to your business. One, perhaps the most obvious, is to get email opt-ins in Facebook. If you have a Facebook page and you're not collecting opt-ins for your email newsletter, fix that when you get back. That's insanity. People on your Facebook page, as we discussed earlier, already like you for reals. So the chances of them filling out an email form is massively higher than somebody who just parachutes onto your website from a Google search. Massively higher. Okay? Best practice is to give somebody something in exchange for that data. It's a, it's a quid pro quo. In our case, if you give us and sign up for, your, for our email newsletter at Convince and Convert, we'll give you a free ebook. Another way to do this is to promote Facebook in your email confirmation. So when people sign up for our email newsletter from the blog, they get an autoresponder email that bounces back, hey man, thanks a lot for signing up for the email. And then we get this little line, please also consider visiting Convince and Convert on Facebook please like us there, right? So we're, we're not, while they're saying yes, keep them saying yes to other things. I haven't implemented this yet because we're in the process of switching um, email systems, but my premise here is to ask people for a Facebook like on the email unsubscribe page. So when they're saying no, ask them to say yes to something different. So if somebody says, you know what, you send me too much email, I don't like your email, you suck, whatever, down at the bottom where it says, take me off your list. We're sorry that you don't want to interact with us in email, but would you like to subscribe to our Facebook updates? Perhaps that's more appropriate or lower impact for you. You got nothing to lose. They already have said you suck. I mean, what's, you know, <laughs> you can't get more unsubscribed than unsubscribe. 
You can also gather email data with social login. I think Jan Rain's here, right? You guys are here. Love, love. There she is. Huge fan of Jan Rain and what they're doing with unified social sign-in and the ability to use Facebook and other things, but primarily Facebook, as a digital passport. So if you have a registration or login on your site for any real meaningful reason, you really need to think about incorporating social login. Because once you do that, once somebody does log in with their social network, you then get access to all of that data behind the scenes, which in every case includes email. That's a useful way to build up your list. And in fact, Janrain survey found that 77% of e-commerce shoppers prefer, prefer to log in with their social media credentials as opposed to creating a new account, which absolutely makes sense. I can, let's see, click one button, I can click one Facebook icon, or I can pick a username, pick a password, fill out a bunch of other crap. You know, it's just way, way faster, way simpler. And we're to the point now that people trust Facebook, perhaps wrongly, but they trust Facebook to be that digital passport across the web. And you should take advantage of that for your business if you have sign in and reg on your website. The other thing you can do is create a social media active segment of your email subscriber base. So in this particular email for Smart Bargains, you can see at the top it says share on Facebook. It's not a particularly compelling creative implementation. It's very demure. But in almost every case, almost every email service provider now gives you the ability to mine that click data and say, OK, how many people clicked that share on Facebook button and who was it? And make me a new list that's only those people. So the next time you have something to say, which is particularly social media oriented, instead of sending it to your whole list, some of who are like, I'm not on Facebook, why are you bothering me? You can send an email only to the people who you know are social media savvy because they've clicked that button in a prior email. And what is crazy to me is that only 18%, according to GetResponse, only 18% of corporate email marketers include social icons in their emails today. What? <laughs> that, that's not very hard to do, right? Like, hmm, let's get an icon that's publicly available and put it into our template. That's like a 30 minute project. Okay, Kermit wants you to be honest about this. How many people here are, have social media icons in their email newsletter? Yay, social fresh. Yay. The other thing you could do, and Eric talked about it yesterday in his presentation about uh, social media shopping and commerce and f-commerce and how only 4% of companies are actually allowing people to transact on their Facebook page, etc. You can test f-commerce inventory via email. This is an email from the Guilt Group, which is of course blowing up, doing crazy things in, in uh, social media and email. This is the, the, um, the regular email that you get from them. Under the men's section, also under the women's section, you can see it says Facebook Store. So they actually test inventory in these emails and certain pieces of the products that they feature in the email are only available on their Facebook page. It's not available on the site and Facebook, it's only available on Facebook, which is a really interesting way to market. I love this example that I, I saw from a post that DJ Waldo had on social media examiner last week this is from a company called Hydro Flask, and they are doing Facebook threshold deals in an email newsletter. The more you like, the more you save. Invite your Facebook friends to like us. If they generate 3,000 likes, everybody gets 10% off. If they generate 3,500 likes, they get 15% off. If they generate 5,000 likes, everybody gets 30% off. Very compelling offer very well executed from the creative standpoint. They put a timeline on it, right? Contest ends on this date. Good use of cross-channel Facebook and email. Let's talk a little bit about message integration. There's a lot of opportunities here. One of the things that is routine or should be routine in email is time of day, day of week testing. Who here has an email testing plan? I know Chris does. 
a few people, not, right, of the people now who, who has an email, right? It was like everybody has an email, six people have a testing plan. I've been doing this long enough, since 94, as Jason mentioned, that I remember people would always ask us, what's the best day to send email, right? And for a long time, it was, well, you don't want to send email on Mondays or Fridays because people go on vacation and, and they don't check their email as much. And so then everybody decided, well, that's probably good advice. What we should do is send emails Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So then every company on the known planet <laughs> sent emails Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And what happened to response rates Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? Off the cliff. So then they said, well, maybe we should go back to this Monday, Friday thing, right? And so it just, it, it, it's this constant craziness. And the, the right answer is it depends. It depends. It depends on your audience. I mean, if you transact across this country, just from a time zone standpoint, there's things that you should be testing. Saturday could work better than Tuesday for certain companies. And we did a research project with Argyle Social a few months ago that found that in social media, some companies can actually have better results nights and Saturdays than they can during the business day, including B2B. So if you're not testing time of day and day of week for email for your organization, you are missing out on results. I can say that without question. And once your test is done, guess what you should do? Start your testing over. Always be testing. A-B-T, second place to set a stake nice. Always be testing, okay? There's always something you can be testing. Every email that goes out of your door should have some sort of testing component in it, ideally. Okay? And you can tie these things together. So if you're going to test time of day, should we send email at 9 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., or 7 p.m.? The results of that test could inform when you put your status updates on Facebook. Could they not? Conversely, if you do some testing of Facebook status update windows and say, you know what, we seem to get a better engagement rate early afternoons, maybe you should try that in your email as well. Same thing with day of week. If you find that you actually have a window of opportunity to send emails on Saturday, maybe you have a window of opportunity to do Facebook on Saturday as well. Combine these testing mechanisms to learn in a one plus one equals three kind of way. You can also do headline testing, especially if you're doing Facebook ads. Who here is doing Facebook advertising on a somewhat regular basis? Not bad, actually. A handful, for sure. 20, 30, something like that. So you can do headline testing cross-channel. If you send an email, you should always be doing subject line testing. A, B test, A, B, C, D test, something like that. Write two headlines, write four headlines. When I send out blog posts, I write, I write a few blog posts a week and some guest posts. Every time I write a blog post, I write three headlines. Every blog post, I write three headlines. The first headline is the one that's actually on the post. And that's the one I tweet at approximately 9 a.m. Eastern. My second favorite headline, I tweet about 11.30 Eastern. And my third favorite headline, I tweet about 3 p.m. Eastern. I write three headlines for every post. I tweet it three times with different headlines. You can do the same thing here with Facebook and email. So if you're going to do a subject line test in your email and say, okay, um, in this case, this is an email for Frontgate, and the subject line is free truck delivery on outdoor makeover essentials, which is not, in my opinion, a terrific headline, you can then test that in Facebook advertising or vice versa. You can use Facebook advertising because you can run a bunch of different ads and find that line that really gets disproportionate clicks and roll that back in to your email program, right? You can also do image testing. This is a, an, also an email from Frontgate where they show three different collections of um, fancy outdoor furniture. Many of you who are doing Facebook ads, I'm sure realize that the image, the thumbnail image in the Facebook ad has a tremendous, tremendous impact on results, much more so even than the headline. You need to be doing that kind of image testing, and you can do the image testing not just within Facebook itself, but within your email. So if you send this email for Frontgate, and you see that the one in the top right gets way more clicks than the other two, that image is clearly salient to your audience. That's the picture I would start my next Facebook ad campaign with. Just make sure that you're clicking, or you're tracking clicks on, on images distinctly in your email program so you can make sure that you know what that data looks like. 
The image matters. Here's a Facebook ad for Salesforce. Love Salesforce, hate this ad. Ridiculous. Like, what is this stupid penguin about? What is he doing? Get a sneak peek of what's coming in the Winter 12 release. Penguin and a logo? Like, I don't get it. I would rather see furniture, even if it's Salesforce. You can also use Facebook to source email content. This is an example from one of our clients, Visit California, where they have this program called California Fives, where people can uh, write in and say, here's my five favorite whatevers in California, five favorite hiking trails, five favorite surf spots, five favorite hot dogs, whatever. And they do this a lot on Facebook and get all kinds of content that they then put into their email newsletter and into their website, which is all SEO, things like that. They're actually crowdsourcing those five favorites great source of content for your email newsletter is to actually ask people on Facebook. Conversely, you can take people's posts on Facebook, fan posts, and roll that into your email newsletter as well. It doesn't have to be a question that you ask. You know how, how sponsored stories works on Facebook, right? Where somebody says, you guys are awesome, I love your cookies. And you can make that an ad. You can do the same thing, but make it part of your email program. This is a, an email newsletter from Jay Jill. In the email, they say, here's statements of support from our Facebook fans. The wherever tank dress is my go-to whenever I need to get dressed up for work. You can also, if you have an email that's not just, hey, we're doing something sort of irrelevant, and you shouldn't be sending that kind of email anyway, but if you have an email that has some sort of depth to it, you can promote that email before it gets sent out on Facebook. Hey, we're gonna send the email, make sure you get on the list. Or in this case for CB2, hey, we're gonna send the email, we're gonna give you special access to it on Facebook first. So they send an email which is their catalog. They put the catalog online, allow people on Facebook early access to it, because again, part of what Facebook is all about is giving people something that makes them feel special. Special. Why do I want to be a fan of yours on Facebook if I get treated like any jerk off the street? If every company in the world has a special offer, yours is not very special. And it's just going to get harder. Facebook is going to get infinitely harder for brands. Because when every company in the world is doing it, you're going to have to get a lot more creative than you are today. A lot more. And this is one of the ways to do it that's low impact for your business. Just give people on Facebook a 24-hour heads up on everything you do before it goes public, and you've got a whole era of feeling special. You can also do some interesting, if you have uh, your teams aligned, some interesting real-time integration between Facebook and email. So if you use something like pagelever.com, and you can do this on, on Facebook native as well, it's just a little harder. In this particular case, this was a status update for Visit California that did particularly well in, within their pantheon of status updates. This status update was, what's one place in California you've never been but have always wanted to go? One place in California you've never been but you've always wanted to go. Good status update. People who do Facebook newsfeed optimization realize asking a question, it'll pull people out. You're only asking them for one thing, not please write me a manifesto. 162 comments, 45 likes, 6117 reach, 357 engaged users. Those are pretty good numbers for that particular company at this point. If you're paying attention to your stats in something that allows real time, like Page Lever as opposed to Native Insights, or you can just look at it in your own stats when you log in, you can see as a marketer, hey, this thing is actually working. This is, we've got something here, right? We've got a fire has been started. Hmm. We've started a fire. What we should do now is send everybody an email asking them to participate in this fire. Bring wood. Come to Facebook, bring a log. Because as everybody here knows, the way edge rank works on Facebook, the rich get richer. If people have interacted with your status update, the chances of them seeing your next status update are infinitely higher. And unfortunately, the converse is true. If you haven't clicked on a status update from a brand for quite a while, they sort of fade away into invisibility. And if you scroll down your Facebook page and like get to the bottom, you're like, I didn't even know that dude was still around. Like you see like all these crazy people that just don't get bubbled up anymore 
because Facebook hides them allegedly for your own protection. So with EdgeRank, the rich get richer. So if you have a successful status update like that, email it out to people immediately so that they come back to your Facebook page, they start interacting with it, and now all of a sudden, the next time you send a status update, a bunch of people will see it. Okay? When you have that social segment, we talked earlier about the icon and creating a social segment of your email newsletter so you know these are the people who are active within social media in your email subscriber list. That's the group you should send this email to. You should not send this email to everybody on your email list and say, we're doing this awesome thing on Facebook, come hang out, because some of those people will not be on Facebook and they will hate you. Be like, I'm not even on Facebook, why are you bothering me? But if you have that list already created, it says we know these people are on Facebook because they've shared our content on Facebook at some point in the past, send them an email and only them. I have given you here 17 different ways to integrate Facebook and email. 17 different ways to do that. But what you should not do is eat all these cookies at the same time. <laughs> I have made this mistake um, in the past and you have to do these things in a sequence like we just talked about. If you don't have the list of people who you know are social active within your email list and you send everybody an email that says come to Facebook, you're going to get some blowback on that, right? So you have to do these things in a particular order, in a particular sequence, but all of these things are doable, right? There's nothing here that requires any particular massive expertise in either email or Facebook. But what it does require is that your Facebook and your email be thought of not as two separate entities, but increasingly as one. That is quite literally all I know about Facebook and email. I am Jay. That's my book. That's my stuff. Let's take some questions. Round of applause for Jay, ladies and gentlemen. We have a couple microphones floating around the room. If you, have you can ask whatever. It doesn't have to be about Facebook and email. You can ask me whatever you want. If you'd like to ask Jay about tequila. I can answer many questions about tequila. Or Indiana. You can answer questions about Indiana as well. Raise your hands high. We've got one back there. If we can get a mic, I'll come here. Or we got a mic coming to you from your right. Wait for the microphone so we can get it on the camera, please. Thank you. Facebook has their business plan. Do they? And, yeah. And, and isn't it critical to migrate, you know, what you think are your, you know, cherries of prospects and clients? Because, I mean, it's quite possible that Facebook is going to try to monetize your page because it's their real estate. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about where you would migrate to your community, your followers, that you have greater authority and control over your tribe? Good question. Um, I think this falls into the category of should Facebook be your social media home base? Should this be the place that you really prefer your customers to interact with you upon? And everybody needs to have that. Right? Every company needs to have a social media home base. And strategically you say, yeah, we're going to be active on Facebook and Twitter and email, of course, and LinkedIn and Pinterest and whatever. But what we want, ideally, is for people to interact with us here. That's the home base. That is your primary residence. The other things are vacation homes. And what you do with your vacation home is try to get people back to your primary residence, right? The primary residence, the social home base for Social Fresh is the Social Fresh blog. What Social Fresh does in Twitter and Facebook and other places is designed to get people back to the blog. Same thing is true in my case. What I do on Twitter drives traffic to convince and convert. Convince and convert drives speaking engagements. Speaking engagements drives clients and book deals. Step and repeat. So a huge strategic blunder that a lot of companies make is thinking that social media channels are inherently equal. And they're not. You have to pick one. You have to say as an organization, you know what? If I had to throw five of these overboard, these are the five I would stop doing tomorrow. But the one I will never stop is this one. And you're right, a lot of companies use Facebook 
as that social media home base because it's easy, it's free, you've got 850 million people there, which are not insignificant advantages, but making Facebook your social media home base is buying a house on rented land, right? If they decide tomorrow, if Facebook decides tomorrow, you know what, screw those guys. No more Facebook fan pages for plumbers. We're anti-plumber. You're SOL, brother. You have no recourse. You got no forum, you got no phone number, you got no mail to, you're done. So I, as much as I love Facebook, and trust me, we do a ton of Facebook consulting, and I certainly am not gonna say don't do Facebook, I take your point, and it's well-founded, that you gotta be careful about putting too many eggs in that basket. Because I think if we've seen anything over time with Facebook, I don't know that they're necessarily nefarious, but they have a hard time keeping a decision, <laughs> right? They change their mind a lot in a way that is, is frustrating and difficult for marketers. Excellent point. Over here, we're gonna go. Sebastian. Uh, first of all, great talk, Jay. Thanks. Uh, what, um, when you talk about testing emails, is that who, are we sending this to your entire email list? I mean, it would, so what type of, like if I wanna talk about um, Facebook marketing and I wanna do an email test, uh, but I want to test at a different time and a different day. I'm sending different subject lines out and different emails yeah. to the same list at okay. different times. Great question uh, on email testing. So what you would ultimately do, let's say you have a list of uh, 5,000, okay? Um, what you would want to do is either do a, a two-way or a four-way test. Typically for a list that size, two-way is a little bit more statistically valid. There are some tools out there that will tell you when, how big your segment needs to be to be statistically valid. Um, Chris may have some information on that and what counts may have one as well. But let's say you uh, say, okay, let's just do a simple A-B test. You write two subject lines, you split the list randomly. Most of your email service providers will have an, a list splitter built into the software. If not, you can easily do it in Excel. You send at the same time one headline to this group, one headline to that group. Same thing with time of day. We're going we're gonna to do it A, B, C, D. We're going to send it at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m., 7 p.m. 1,250 people get each version. And then you just individually check the stats. Chris Penn. If you have a list of at least 16,800 addresses, you need, you need to have that many. To do an AB or to do an ABCD? To do a time of day, day of week test. Yeah. What we suggest you do is take that list to divide it into 168 parts of 100 addresses each and send every hour on the hour for a week. Look at the results. You will find there is no best time of day or day of week. There'll be clusters like yeah. Tuesdays, you know, between 10 and 11 or 11 and 12, and Thursdays, and okay, Saturdays at you know, 9, 10, and 11 when people are drinking heavily and checking their email for no good reason. Yeah. <clears throat> but doing it that way shows you the entire spectrum of the whole week. If your list supports that and your content supports that, you will find that out very quickly. The other option, and this is something that goes back to your point, is if you try out um, the software crowdbooster.com, mm -hmm. they have a, when are your Twitter followers act most active? Look at that, look at where they're most active, send emails during those times. Yeah, online is online, right? I mean, that's, that's the, the premise there, is that if you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're probably checking email at the same time, or have access to checking email. Yeah, day of week is a lot easier to test than time of day, because time of day, what is it, what, there's no such thing as 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock here is seven o'clock in California, so the, it's a little bit, it's, it's harder to make hay of that because it's not consistent time zones. Yeah, I was a little confused when you said um, if, if you get their Facebook information, you get all this other information about them, yeah. like their email and all that stuff. What other information do you get about somebody when you get their Facebook That's information? That's a better question for Jan Rain to, to address, um, but everything that they've given Facebook primarily, which is a lot of stuff. When you do the Facebook logins is what you're talking about. Yes, when you and do you social can, logins. Mm -hmm. You can define what that gives you. That's right. And it can be just the email or it can be a lot of information. Yep. So theoretically, it's where you went to high school and you know what movies you like and what TV shows you like. So you can actually do some really interesting email content. If you have social sign-in with something like Jan Rain, you can then take that content so you know, for example, I know what movies you like because you've said that on Facebook. Let's say I sell movies. Next time I send you an email, what do you think the movies I'm going to include that email are? the movies that you like. So you can do some pretty extraordinary data mining in that, in that way. Okay. Is that on? Okay, okay. sorry. Um, one area that's been kind of growing when it comes to the use of social media and online communities is in healthcare. And I'm, 
I'm managing developing social media strategies and online, online community strategies for an area health system. And it's been a process. And what I, I just want to kind of pick your brain if, because what we've talked about a lot is, in, is a lot of retail and a lot of, a lot of direct to customer and things like that. But a health system, specifically a community hospital, is going to have a, need to have a significantly different approach. And I was just wondering uh, what, what your view is on how and a company or a, I guess, a health system or a hospital, how they would make the best use of Facebook, Twitter, or online communities? Great question. I, we actually just finished a huge project for a, a chain of regional hospitals, so it's a, it's a very fresh topic for me. Um, fresh, social fresh. Um, <laughs> I feel like when you're in a B2B or regulated scenario, like healthcare financial services, it becomes content first, social second. That social media is the gas on the fire. Content is the fire, social is the gas. When you're, when you're a B2C retail kind of company, social media can become its own content. In B2B, health, financial services, boring companies, no offense intended, it has to be more educational, more informational, more content driven and you use social to get eyeballs on it. It's a totally different playbook, right? So what I always tell companies is, look, why, why do you even have a Twitter account or a Facebook page unless you have a content program? What are you, what are you sending Facebook status updates about in a B2B context if you don't have a content plan? Like, here's what we're serving in the break room? Like, nobody cares, <laughs> right? You have to go content first, social second if you're in those kind of industries, right? So what we did for that particular program is we actually did a really in-depth taxonomy analysis where we looked at social media chatter across all type of healthcare topics, heart, pediatrics, et cetera, uh, and then also did a similar analysis of search behavior. Molded those together, came up with a hit list of very specific keywords and key phrases, and then methodically created content opportunities over the course of a year and said, okay, we're gonna do these, we're gonna make these 32 pieces of content. Um, and it's not just web pages. Some of them are events and videos and movies, all kinds of stuff. But there's a, there's a strategy behind it. And then what social media is, is the marketing plan for your content. Does that make sense? Uh, can we get a microphone? OK. To okay. the back of the room, go ahead. I have a question going back to emails for Where a second. Where are you? Here. Oh, thanks, sorry. <laughs> um, what do you think about time-optimized emails? Yeah, some email service providers will, yeah. will do that. I know Silverpop does it, and some other ones do as well, I think, where, where to Chris's point, um, that, that they do that 168 part, send in different email every hour sort of automatically in the software, and then figure out, hey, this guy is, it's 2 o'clock where he lives, and he tends to open his inbox at this time, so let's make sure we send emails in that window. Genius. If your ESP has that, has that option, Yes, we do have, that every time. We have been doing that for the past few months. Nice. Uh, using Engage. Sure, yeah. And um, we've seen a huge change in, in email opens and clicks. Yeah, of course. I mean, would you rather send email to somebody when you're almost positive they're checking email or send email to somebody when you're not sure whether they are or not, right? It's a no-brainer. Because the more emails that you have in your inbox when you open it, the less likely you are to look at any of those emails, right? I mean, your choosiness gets way different if you've got 150 unopened emails, right? You've got to have a pretty good subject line to get attention in that environment, which is why one of the rules of thumb, but again, it depends, is it's hard to send email first thing in the morning because everybody wakes up, they open that email box, 58% of the country checks email first, and it's like, holy crap. Delete, 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 granola bar, coffee, delete, 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 newspaper, you know, carpool, boom, right? I mean, you're like... Overboard, overboard, overboard. And so if we're sending emails, we have a regular email that's a newsletter that we send out every week, do you, and we've been doing it on the same day for, say, five, six years. Do you think it's worth it to try a different, different days? day? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, and ideally, it's, uh, you know, if the software supports it, send it on a different day to different people. Right? It doesn't have to be Wednesday. It could be whatever day you want. If it's a newsletter that doesn't, by definition, have time-sensitive information in it, right? Which a lot of newsletters don't, right? It's like, if you look at this newsletter content Monday versus Thursday, it doesn't really matter, right? It's not gonna be a huge issue. So in those cases, do the testing and say, okay, this is now our Monday list. 
this is the Wednesday list and send those people the content on that day. Does that make sense? Um, I was just wondering, you said that you Where are you? Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering we'll bring, you we'll bring flags next time so they can wave them for you. <laughs> or just stand up would be perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, you said you tweeted. You're a tall drink of water, my man. <laughs> you said you <laughs> tweeted all your articles three times a day. I was wondering, um, are you switching your blog post titles to the one that gets the most clicks? I don't. Um, I probably should, but I don't want to sort of jack with it and then sort of republish it and all those kind of things. And, and I actually um, try and, and, and build um, keywords where I can into that first one. So I probably should switch it, but I don't. It's a good idea. I should and, and then I was also wondering, how do you uh, measure, you know, which one is the best based on, you know, how do you know, um, you know, based on how many people are on Twitter at that time if you're tweeting it three times at different times? Yeah, I mean, it's not an empirical test, obviously, because some of it's, some of it's power of the headline, some of it's the, the window, some of it's, hey, what else is going on in the world, some of it's time zone. So what I, what I do see is um, less of a pattern than I would like to see, right? What I'd like to see is, you know what, this particular time is consistently best, um, and I don't see that. It really depends on the post, um, because sometimes what I've realized is that the second or third headline is actually a better headline. Right? And, and the other thing is you've got other factors, right? You've got, in my case, however many people are retweeting it and the, and the impact of those people, and it sort of builds a little crescendo of attention, those kind of things. So it's, it's not a perfect test, but, but I use Argyle Social for those kind of things. And, and they have that kind of tracking built into the tool, which is handy to at least have the data. And then what you make of the data um, is subject to interpretation. Over here on your left, Jay. Thank you for standing up, sir. Oh. Following instructions quite well. Thank you. Um, I like the idea that you presented about opt-in email forms in Facebook. Yeah. I think that's definitely underused. And I understand landing, landing tab, right, would be the best place for it. Well, I understand the landing page idea. Now that Facebook has changed and those links are very small on the left, can you give us some advice on getting people to go to those links for either yeah. forms or surveys? It's a great question, and, and it is underreported in this industry. Social Fresh, you need to do some We'll get on this, it. That, that you're absolutely right, sir, that, that if you look at the stats, and PageLeaver's done some reports on this as well, the percentage of Facebook fans that go to any tab is pretty low. And once they've become a fan, it's really, really low. Because think about this. How often do you become a Facebook fan and then go back to the actual Facebook page? Not very often. Once you click that like button, overwhelmingly, your relationship with that organization on Facebook will take place in the news feed. Overwhelmingly. Unless, unless you are driven back to the page or a particular tab by either a status update or an email or some other modality. So to answer your question, that's how you do it, right? Is that you have a news feed and once a week, once every two weeks, you put in a status update that says, hey kids, are you getting our email? It's awesome and you get special offers and whatever and then you drive them from the status update back to to a tab that you've created just to harvest emails now what most people would do historically and when I mean historically I mean like October is um, <laughs> is they would say hey sign up for our email newsletter and they would drive them back to the website right which is a bad call if they're on Facebook guess what they want to stay on Facebook. People spend an average of seven plus hours on Facebook. They don't spend seven plus hours on your website. So there's a reason why they're on Facebook. Right? It's the same thing as you know, when you're doing Facebook ads. The, the performance of Facebook ads that drive people to a Facebook page versus Facebook ads that drive people off Facebook, it's like this. It's night and day. Why? Because you're keeping them in the channel that they're already on. So get on our email list, go to the tab, as opposed to get on our email list, go to the website. That's the play, for sure. Okay. And most of your email service providers have built-in code to do that now, have a Facebook email address collection widgety type thing. Right, Chris? That's a pretty standard issue at this point. Yeah, it's a form, and you can iframe it or just drop it in or whatever. And we, uh, for those of you who were here last year, we had a whole day on Facebook, and that was one of the topics we covered, which is shameless plug in the academy. 
Um, and one of the big tips I think that we got out of that was how you can use Facebook ads the same way you can use email. Yeah. So there's a cost associated with Facebook ads, but you can send your Facebook ads only to your Facebook fans, which is like sending an email to your email subscribe list, and you can point them back with that ad to a landing tab with a conversion or to some type of survey on Facebook or to a status update like we talked about with the sponsored stories. But to, to, to expand on your point, I'm not a big proponent of, of creating a whole bunch of expensive, complicated, highfalutin tabs because it's a waste of time in, in most cases. Right? Unless you have a specific contest or promotion or something around that, it's, it's usually just spitting in the wind. Jay, question, just continuing that conversation, would you recommend people run ads or push people from other social channels to an email tab specifically? Is that one of the best uses of a tab to convert those social channels into email? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, certainly test it. Just want to the, one, the one issue there, and the nice thing about Facebook ads is that you can do it on a cost per click basis, of course. The one issue there is sequencing, right? So if you use Facebook ads to drive people to email, because we've talked about people become your Facebook fan after they already have transacted with you, what is the likelihood that those people who see those ads are already on your email list, right? So, so are you preaching to the choir at that point? And that sequencing is going to be different for, for different companies, but it's certainly worth testing. And because you can do it on a cost per click basis, that's the, that's the way to do it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. We have time for one or two more questions. Do we have any in the back? Raise your hands high. We've got one here, one more. Anybody? All right. We will end with this one then. Thank you. Where are you? I'm just kidding. You're <laughs> Thank you for sharing all your knowledge. Sure. Um, my question is about emails and whether you should always be having an offer or whether you should mix it up and maybe have a branding email, if, what your thoughts are on that. I think you should send emails that are relevant to the people who get the emails. And, and so it depends. It depends on the kind of company you are, and you can test that, right? So one of the tests we used to do when I ran an email company is, um, is, is that kind of sequential offer testing, right? Where we would send offer, 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 and see what the break point is, because there will be a break point. If you pay attention to the stats, at some point people will be like, I'm not going to click anymore. And the challenge with sending an offer every time is that you train people to wait for the offer. People aren't stupid, right? They know that the deal is coming. Greatest sale ever! And then Monday, it's a better sale than last <laughs> week, right? It's like, how can that be? Um, so, so I, I would not always send offers because then basically you're Groupon without the timeliness. But at the same token, I don't know what a branding email means, right? I mean, what, what you know, I mean, I, I, I know what it means, but, but I don't, I'm not certain how a branding email drives relevance. So every time you send an email, you need to think of a couple things. One, how does this make the recipient's life better? And if it doesn't, don't send it. And two, what specifically do we want the people to do when they get this email? Best way to do it is to write that down, three things. First thing we want them to do ideally is this. Second thing we want them to do if they don't do that is this. Third thing is this. Actually literally write down on a piece of paper before you send an email, ideal behavior, secondarily ideal behavior, tertiarily ideal behavior, and, and then measure and model that. Because if you send an email to anybody without thinking that through, the chances of them not doing what you want them to do goes up considerably because you won't write it that way, you won't design it that way, you won't funnel it that way. And frankly, kids, it's the same thing when you send a business email in Outlook. If you don't have a call to action or a point to that email, don't send it, right? Well, I guess to follow up, if it's not an offer and there has to be a call to action. What else would it be? Well, would it be an informational kind sure. of email? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to there's a lot of reasons to, so they to convey information with somebody that isn't necessarily get. buy, right? It's humanization, which is the core of social media, building that relationship. Let us tell you something about our company you didn't already know. Let's feature one of our other customers. Let's show you how to use our product in a way that you haven't thought of. You know, let's do um, a, a customer of the week feature. Let's, you know, there's a lot of things that, that you can do other than buy stuff from us. It's, you've already bought from us, use it differently, use it better. Here's other people who, who have worked with us. Here's our awesome employee of the month. There's a lot of other things that you can do. And that would encourage them to open it because they don't yeah. know what they're going to do. read get. it and maybe it's share it. Maybe what you want them to do is share it in social media, right? Maybe what you want to do is get them to click and read a particular 
piece of information because you can then use that click behavior to send more relevant email down the road. So I used to do some work in the real estate business and, and we had a big master plan community that we worked with and they had several different um, types of, of real estate. So they had big like three, four bedroom family style homes. They had uh, two bedroom kind of town homes and then they had sort of one bedroom uh, urban loft apartment kind of deals, right? All in the same community. Highly different types of, of product that appeal to a different buyer. But when people signed up for the email, we didn't want them to bucket themselves there because every time you add a field to an email sign-up form, your response rate goes down in a linear fashion. So it's like, let's just get their email. What we did, though, was in the follow-up sequence, the first email you got was, we've got this kind of thing, this kind of thing, and this kind of thing. And then we measured who clicked what first. Whatever they clicked first, that's the bucket we put them in. So we basically self-segmented. Now we have a single-family home list and a two-bedroom townhome list and an urban loft list without actually asking them. We just looked at their behavior. So that's what you can do in some of these emails that aren't specifically an offer. You can give them some different types of information about your company and see how they interact with that content and then use that to send them more relevant information down the road. The premise, right, the whole premise here is that eventually where you need to go is there's no such thing as a newsletter. You don't send the same email to everybody ever. You really shouldn't. You really shouldn't. If you're sending everybody on your list the same email, you're not doing email as well as you could, period, for every company. I, don't, I send everybody the same email in my company, and I know better. I used to do email marketing for a living. I know it's hard, but that's the reality. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Great question. And some other great follow-up stuff. You can actually go to the What Counts blog, formerly the Blue Sky Factory blog that Chris Penn is a contributor to.